The Silent King, Part 3 I am Kari Pasha, majestic lord of the shifting stars, herald of the night unending, keeper of the sempiternal tomb, humbler of the Knib, a pharaoh of the Nefrek dynasty, the warriors of the golden stars. Yet, I am not who I was. I remember this scenario all too well. For it is not the first time I have stood, chained, dishonored, dejected, awaiting the decision of the Triarch. I am surrounded by the Praetorians, his mighty Lich Guard, form phalanx after phalanx on the plains before me. As ever he did, Cesaric, the Silent King, always impresses. His might is second to none, his grandeur is sublime, his word is law. At least, that is what we are expected to believe. How we are trained to react to this once glorious figure of our people, how the times have changed, yet everything has remained the same. Such a long trudge to this place again. As it was all of those years ago, in another time, another place. Yet all is truly the same. For I, Kripasha, am mighty, even in the ranks of the Pharaons. I have bowed before. I have sworn never to bow again. But that is before things changed before we, as a race entire, changed. I was one who did not wish to become living metal, who rejected the necrodermis that now constitutes my entire being. Like a picture out of focus, with the heat hazes of the desert sun obscuring the most important details, shimmering to make that which you see both more and less than it actually was or is. Or should be, if seen clearly at close proximity, I am more and less than I was. For there is nothing to me of that which was ephemeral, made me more than merely the actions and thoughts which now define my entire existence, my passion. It gave me drive, made me stronger. How I miss my hate. I am immortal. I am self-repairing. I am now eternal. But I am not me. Not any longer. Like a cheap copy, I am an echo of who I should have been. And I would lament that I did not die as I was, who I was, instead of living eternally like this. For now I know I am bereft of even the sting of hatred and resentment to the degree I once had. Oh, when I was alive. When I was in constant pain, I. But when I was me. I was a force of nature. An unstoppable power. I was Kali Pasha, and all knelt before me, except only the Triarch. My Nemesis led my armies. My forces were acclaimed as the best trained in all of my dynasty. Some said I would have been able to stand against even Imotic, the Storm Lord, had I but more experience. And then. Oh, then, I was in love. Not easy for beings such as we, Necron Tear. 
for the constant pain made discourse more an act of will, an act of restraint. But, rare as it was, when I looked on her, my mind cleared, and the constant screaming from my sinews even silenced. When I looked at her, my world was calm, my mind tranquil. For she was so beautiful. She was high in the esteem of all, a worthy consort. For her phalanxes matched my own, her holdings as expansive. It was to be a political union of advantage. Yet, on that first day, our joining day, when I saw her and she saw me, our worlds were magnified. The bonfire of our dreams became a roaring fire. There was nothing we could not do together. Nothing. We were joined and were never separated again. Not for one moment of one day did we part. During our councils we sat and listened, then gave our deliberations, and we were most often in accord. Her wisdom was unique, her courage equal to mine own, and we swept from our unified holdings like gods. None could gainsay us, none could match us. And even against the ancient enemy, it was we two acting in tandem that brought rare victory after rare victory. Where others were outmaneuvered and outnumbered by the shiny ones, the old ones, we always had more than we declared, always made the trap too delicious for them to ignore. Hence we were some of the few who, even then, even in the first war, were able to win some victories. Few, but some and more than any other. Yet, we lost. And we were trapped in the fringes of the galaxy, along with the shattered remains of our people. And then, the three, the ruling kings, made compact with the Catan. And the horror began. The change of our people, herded into these places that made Necron tear into the legions of the Necrons. Not that we knew the name then, of course. I looked upon my bride, my pride, my perfect partner, and we decided to ignore them. We would not yield. We would not be forced to change into this deathless form. Because we knew it deep within ourselves. If we were to be as unyielding as stone, as hard as metal, made of it, we knew our love would end. We would go through the motions. We might even have ruled for all eternity. Yet there would be no passion. We would not ache to be near one another, to touch one another. Not yearn for the end of the day's work, so we could be together again. So, we resisted, and we did well. But inevitably, it was not possible to win. Betrayed by a minor lord of my own household, the Triarch Praetorians came for us one night. What they could not achieve on the battlefield was gained through treachery. And they overpowered my Lich Guard and took us both in a daring lightning raid. As we woke, my love and I fought them directly. My sword took three heads, her eyes took two. But we were overpowered by these new metallic monsters. And then we were both dragged to a place like this one. To see him. To meet directly with the Silent King and his two subordinates. Strangely, they gave us honor for fighting so well. But inexorably, they gave us no choice. We were dragged to that furnace and thrown in, the two of us coming out as the silver of the new people, the Necron. 
we looked into each other's new eyes and felt nothing. Nothing at all. Yet we played the role. We went through the motions and we clasped each other as we walked back to him and bowed. I did not remember the decision to kneel. I did not remember the weighing of options, the analysis of what was decreed. I did not think whatsoever when he pronounced my new position what he wished me to do. And we never once questioned him or any of the dictats from that point onwards. For he was the king. And for some reason, that now meant his word was actually law. None needed to even decide on agreement, to feel fear of the repercussions of his disapproval. We did not obey out of love or fear or any sort of choice. We just obeyed. I, Kripa Shah, was a thrall. And my wife, my previous love, she was also. Everything that we had been was taken from us. And we could never even consider retribution. It was inconceivable. Later, after millions of years of combat, when we finally won the war, we were forced to go into the stasis crypts, to take our entire people and holdings with us into slumber across time. And we did not even raise a single question. We obeyed. Again. Time passed, and we awoke. But things were different, slightly, subtly, but substantially. It was like a mist had been removed from my eyes. I could act. I could decide. I could even feel my rage again. Not as it was, but their embers. And I was able to strike those who had also awoken, <laughs> but were weak. There was no compulsion anymore, no unseen force inhibiting my mind and actions, and I let loose, crushing all around us. Starting with the new and weak youthful races, continuing to the local lords who had always hid behind the skirts of the rule of law. But now, now there seemed to be no king. He had not awoken, or had gone into exile as some said. Yet without him, I could do what I wilt again, finally. Alas, my love, my eternal consort, she did not fare so well. She would disappear for days on end, then return festooned with the wrappings of viscera of a low-born race. And it repulsed me. She could not speak, and could not sit, and could not advise me, even as she had done before the sleep. She was gone. Yet I did her honor. Out of the shared memories we had, nothing and nobody impedes her in my court. Yet sometimes I find her looking at me. Sometimes I find her looking at me, swaying in the doorway, before she leaves on another of her excursions, to who knows where and when, as if she is trying to remember who I am, trying to remember why I am the only one she will not attack if they approach. But she is gone. Everything that was my life before is now dead. We are but corporeal ghosts, I know less a vision of horror than she. And yet, it happened again, ironically. I was organizing yet another subjugation, another set of smaller systems, to be brought under my banners. 
The local nemesaurs were weak, their abilities paling into the dust compared to me and mine. Yet, as another evening came on, there they were again. Millions of years later, half a galaxy away from the original event, yet it happened so similarly. A pale light, the appearance of his guards, his Praetorians in my very personal chambers. This time I was not half asleep, this time I was prepared more. I fought them just as hard, taking near a score of them as they came at me one by one. They had honour this time at the least. Tireless though my new form was, the constant battle eventually chipped away at me faster than my repair protocols could handle. And finally, I fell again. And here I am, again, being dragged before the silent king and his two satellites. I am unceremoniously dumped onto the sands at his feet as he hovers there on his dais of dominion. Hapsatra the Radiant, a mesophet of the shadowed hand at his sides. I am worth more than both combined, yet the king again has chosen to surround himself with sycophants and toadies. Yet, as I look at him, I feel something change within me. I cannot take my eyes off him. I cannot do anything but kneel and feel that this is right. That this is how it should be. How it always should have been. I see the light. For he is Cesaric. He is the last and silent king of the final Triarch. But now, after seeing him again in all of his glory, his magnificence. Now, I cannot even conceive of defying or rebelling against him. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the factions, faces, and forces of the Warhammer 40k setting. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. Don't forget, we have a natural history and mythology channels now, so go have a look. Links in the description. Now, let us proceed. For this week, we are to discuss the ongoing activities of the Silent King of the Necrons. What is he up to? What has he already done? Where is he aiming, and how will he get there? And, gentle listener, it is not for the faint of heart. For the Silent King is making the most sweeping moves of any of the largest factions, and he is by far the most dangerous to the very continuation of humanity and its mighty Imperium. Now, if you are not aware of the history of this titanic figure from the depths of history, then I have a comprehensive set of videos on him. Links also in the description. But let us get stuck in. Consolidation of Power Now for an update on the activities of the Silent King, how he has reforged his court. Let us do what we always do. And so, as usual, let us lean on existing wisdom. From the 9th edition Codex for Necrons. To quote... For all the gaps in recollection that veil elements of Zarek's life, at least his motivation for returning to the galaxy appears straightforward. The Silent King abandoned exile to save his people from the menace of the Tyranids. It is said that he encountered dormant hive fleets flowing through the intergalactic darkness towards the galaxy he had left behind, and recognized the perils they represented what if they devoured all life before the Necrons could reverse biotransference? Worse, what if Cesarek's people had already managed their apotheosis, just in time to be devoured in turn? Supposedly driven by pure altruism and a desire not to fail his people again, Cesarek turned the song of oblivion 
back towards the distant glimmer of the stars he had known so long ago. This story in itself has holes. What did Zazarek witness, and of what scale, that so convinced him of this omnipresent peril? How did he chance across the encroaching Tyranids amidst the near-infinite gulfs of space? Questions of pretext and motivation have been raised, however briefly, by the more rebellious amongst the royal courts, and whispers persist that the Silent King harbors some other deeper agenda. Few find themselves able to sustain their doubts for long, however, and for those who do, the Triarch Praetorians are never far behind. Such shadows and whispers soon burn away in the searing light of Cesarek's presence. It is said that merely meeting the Silent King in person is to transfer even the keenest doubter into a supplicant desperate to do his will. Shortly after revealing himself openly to his people, Cesarek chose two pharaohs of lesser dynasties who had proven their loyalty through swift service. Subsuming their legions into Cesarek's ranks, the Silent King elevated Hepsatra the Radiant, a mesophet of the Shadowed Hand, to form his new triarch. They became the Pharaoh of the Stars and the Pharaoh of the Blades, as ancient codes dictated, joining Cesarek upon his mighty dais of dominion, from where they could proclaim the Triarch's will. There are those who have noted how thoroughly the two Pharaohs are bound into the dais, how their voices have taken on a new tone of command since their ascension, and how they speak nearly always with perfect synchronicity. But of course, elevation to the final triarch was bound to affect changes upon such minor rulers, and if they seem always to support Cesarek's plans without question, those plans were millennia in the laying after all. Who could honestly suggest amendments to such a comprehensive scheme. The martial might of the final triarch, at least, is beyond question. Cesarek's dais is empowered by a caged shard of Nyadra Zatha himself, while the Silent King's mantle is formed from the Catan's flensed necrodermis. It is the burning one's own fire that Cesarek amplifies through his regal scepter of eternal glory, sending it blazing forth in searing beams of absolute destruction. That same energy is channeled into the potent carrier wave generators of the Dares that coordinate and motivate nearby Necron soldiery, and also into the Noctilus beacons held high above Cesarek's throne. These beacons not only banish the infernal energies of the warp, but also allow the Silent King to tear open the invisible skeins of the webway, fashioning his own temporary dolmen gates to bear him swiftly across into stellar gulfs. Those foes not erased by Cesarek's energy blasts are far from safe, while Hapsatra unleashes furies of neuron orbs from the Staff of Stars. Mesophet hefts the size of dust, every swing of its glimmering blade reducing victims to swirling clouds of scorched particles. Enemies who get close to strike at Zazarek directly are forced to their knees by the thumbing energies of his deus's obeisance generators. Even those blows that manage to hit home are unlikely to do harm. The Silent King and his companions are swathed in a transtemporal field that scatters the force of the foe's attacks and thus dissipates them harmlessly. All the while, a pair of Triarch menhirs orbit Cesarek's dais, proclaiming the Triarch's omnipotent might even as they channel the dais's power. By focusing the resonance of these devices, Cesarek can unleash a devastating annihilator beam, an energy weapon so potent that it has been likened to the hurled spear of an enraged god. None who feel its wrath live to tell the tale. Hands of the Triarch Cesarek is ancient to a degree that makes the Primarchs themselves appear short-lived by comparison. In all the long millennia he has lived, the Silent King has honed one skill above all others. He is a master of winning the loyalty of all those he can, 
and of coercing or tricking all those he cannot into serving him regardless. Some, of course, serve him all too willingly. Those who remember Cesaric as the great saviour of their race, or who hold loyalty to the Triarch above all other considerations. The Triarch Praetorians are foremost amongst these. Having learned of their master's return, hundreds of Praetorians gather before him upon the tomb world of Antrak, while thousands more joined the gathering as hardlight holograms beamed in from strongholds and tomb ships the galaxy over. During that gathering, the Praetorians reaffirmed their fealty to the Silent King and the Triarch. They have acted as Cesarek's unwavering servants every day since, and will do so until the galaxy belongs to the Necrons once more. Many are the Pharons who have sworn allegiance to the Silent King since his return, but there are those, of course, who reject his rule. Decrying the Triarch as a needless relic and Cesarek as the one to blame for all the Necrons' ills. Such rebels are in the minority, however, and almost no one who has stood before his dares has long sustained their resistance. Most dynasties swear new and binding oaths of obedience to Cesarek's rule all the time, some giving themselves over entirely to the Cesarekan dynasty, while others offer mutually beneficial allegiances. Countless smaller groups serve Cesaric also, some officially, others in a more secretive or mercenary capacity. The Breath of Silence, for instance, are a sinister guild of jade-skinned death marks who appear without warning, eliminate Cesaric's enemies, and are gone as silently as a zephyr of cosmic wind. Cesaric can never officially recognize their contribution for they are dishonorable by their very nature, unlike his personal lichguard phalanx. Famed as the stellar size, these elite killers possess augmented mental engrams that allow them to philosophize, practice elaborate diplomacy, and converse at great length and with high intellect. They march to war in bodies of metagold and noctilis, and each possesses a personal doom-sized fighter craft Thus do these elite warriors serve as Cesarek's envoys and companions, as his peerless bodyguards, and even as his airborne escort when he leads his legions into battle. So, the old horror is consolidating his power across the entire Necron race, for he did relinquish his authority over them before delving into the darkness between galaxies. Now he has returned. Yet, when even his greatest rebels are brought before him, they are immediate converts again. The conclusion for me is simple. The Silent King is reinstating the command engrams that he once had over his lords and race entire. But now he has to get them to him, for he can only override their minds and programming if he sees them directly in front of him or so it seems. And this is the only thing I can see that would break the will of a recalcitrant and rebellious Necron. That there is no choice but to serve, as he had over his people in the time after the biotransference. This, to me at least, clarifies what he is doing to regain control. But what is that rascal up to? What is he actually doing with his power? Ah. Let us now return to the existing wisdom of the Necron's 9th edition Codex. To quote, Nexus of Doom. As more and more Necrons awake, and as their armies of conquest push ever outward, so the galactic territories they control expand. Yet the dynasties are fractured, their strength scattered, and their leaders as likely to fall upon one another's armies as to ally against the common foe. Though their nobility refuse to countenance the truth, or in many cases are engrammatically incapable of doing so, the likelihood of Necron Galactic dominance has, for long millennia, been virtually nil. The return of Cesarek, last of the Silent Kings, to the galaxy may change all of this, however. At the same time, and in response to the opening of the Great Rift, 
anti-chaos protocols have released a long-imprisoned sect of cryptex known as the Technomandrites. It was the command of the Silent King himself that saw these beings interred, for their sheer brilliance eclipsed that of all their rivals and, by forming a single united guild, they risked becoming a power block that could eclipse the Triac themselves. Yet now, Cesarek seeks to implement a plan so vast in scope and ambitious in scale, that he has chosen to treat with the Technomandrites and attempt to win their favor. In the case of many, though by no means all, he has succeeded. For the Silent King scheme is a masterstroke. By employing arrays of immense, negatively polarized Noctilus pylons, he seeks to create zones that humanity, in their dawning terror and ignorance, have christened Pariah Nexes. Each of these regions span interstellar gulfs, their malign energies radiating out through the webs of pylons from one world to the next, and blanketing swathes of the galaxy in a shroud of soul-crushing energy. While the Cyclopean pylons rise to the skies, entire regions of real space are cut off from the warp as though by a fractal wall of gas. Though the effect is not absolute, warp travel and translation, astropathic messaging and the manifestation of demonic or psychic energies becomes vastly more difficult. Should the scattered nexus sites extend until their fields merge, Cesarek believes that the threat of chaos could be defeated forevermore. Yet this is but one goal of his insidious plan. For the absolute absence of empiric energies would prove as detrimental to the lesser races as does its current ferocious excess. Living beings within the Pariah Nexus find themselves afflicted by numbing despair that worsens over time, until eventually they slip into a fugu state and thence into irreversible soul death. This fate leaves their physical forms mindless, yet still alive. The perfect vessels for experimentation into the reversal of biotransference. Through his grand scheme, and with the Technomandrite's aid, the last Silent King seeks to provide his people with a means to reverse the damnation he brought upon them. And in doing so, unite the Necrons that they might defeat those foes that endure and reclaim the galaxy at last. End quote. The long surmised and anticipated actions of the Silent King are heading exactly as everyone thought. To not only retake the galaxy and crush the Tyranids, but to also solving the greatest issue of the Necrons, the reversal of the biotransference. And it seems very likely that humanity is the form he is considering. With the background of the pariahs and their genesis, and the confirmation that new Necrons are indeed being created en masse, it seems the Silent King is doing what he has always done. Attempting to save his race and bring order back to the galaxy. Now the Lord of the Blood Angels, Dante, has been met by the Silent King. Perhaps there is some form of slippage in his plan, perhaps. He would have his people take the form of the humans, yet remain somehow allied with them. Or perhaps, he wishes to use the Imperium as a buffer or buffet to blunt the advance of the Tyranids as he prepares his counter. For Cesarek has been in a ship larger than a moon, perhaps larger than Phalanx itself, and with the power of the Necrons, the ship has already destroyed a world on its own like a Death Star. His capital ship is able to blow a celestial body into pieces. But perhaps, this is not the only ship thus made. Perhaps, the greatest weapons of the Necrons are still being raised from their slumber or so. The fell artifacts that allowed him to defeat the Catan at their height of power might well be being collected by his men from secret dark places in the galaxy. For the talismans of Vol, the Blackstone Fortresses are but one element that might have fought in the war in heaven, and thus the Necron's own weaponry would be as powerful, if not more so. 
and that alone is a terrifying thought. But do remember, there is an artifact known as the Celestial Orrery, protected by the royal court of Thanatos, Necrons. But, as we have heard, none can truly defy the Silent King if, if he so wishes. With the Celestial Orrery, he can predict the future, affect how it plays out. He can control the very stars themselves, winking them out of existence if he should so wish. The Silent King is thus, at present at least, pulling his punches, and to a staggering degree. Perhaps the Silent King will confuse his enemies with overtures of friendship, as he has already made to Dante, or perhaps he is actually looking for an ally against the bugs and chaos. But with a being as subtle, patient and callous as the King of the Necrons, it is impossible to say. The only thing anyone can project with any confidence is that the grim darkness of the far future has just gotten a lot more of both. Grim, and so very, very dark. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. A reminder that we have other avenues of entertainment. Links in the description. Give us a like and share if you enjoyed the video. To support our ongoing efforts against boredom, do consider joining our Patreon. Also linked in the description. And thank you for your precious time. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.